You're listening to the Full Circle Music Show, the why of the music biz. Hey, welcome back to the Full Circle Music Show. It's Chris Murphy, as always, sitting next to Seth Mosley. How are you, sir? I'm good. What's up, man? Did you have a good Christmas? Man, I had a really good one. Uh, it seems like that the year flew by, but uh, here we are at the end of the year, uh, and we've got a great interview with Mia Fields. Yeah, Mia is awesome. She's been a longtime friend of mine from Down Under, and uh, <laughs> she she's an incredibly talented songwriter, uh, artist, communicator, and uh, friend more than anything. Um, so I'm excited for you guys to hear our conversation with her. Uh, one, it, it's actually one of my favorite moments in the podcast, the relatively short podcast history, where she actually does a live unfiltered rap on air. She kills it, man. I loved it. I love that she had the, uh, the the nerve to actually pull it off there. And and this is this is the unveiling of of Mia Fields as a rap artist. So, but we talk a lot uh, about her story and what it takes to be a successful songwriter. And her, uh, just her positivity and her ability as an, an, an amazing collaborator. So here it is, Mia Fields, great songwriter, uh, great person, uh, great singer as well, and now future rapper. Check her out at MiaFieldsMusic.com. That's M-I-A-F-I-E-L-D-E-S Music.com. So primarily songwriter, but also an artist. Yes. You say that with hesitance. I say that, well, because I always think of it as like a songwriter who sings a few songs, but mostly writes songs. So I don't really see it like, I mean, I guess it is artist, but I kind of see it like just still a songwriter. (laughs) Yeah. I guess somebody has to sing the song that you wrote. Yes. In order to get it out to everybody else. And I really like it when other people do it. Yeah. It's like kind of my favorite thing. So what what came first? Singing? Oh, no. Singing singing definitely did not come first. Um, I... I always say I'm a Jonathan, not a David, you know, and I, so I feel like God always like partners me with the Davids of Mm. the world. Like, and like, even by that, I kind of mean like, um, like Jonathan was the King's son. So I guess like, by like yesterday's standards, he should have been, he was next in line to be King, except that like God anointed David. And like, I love that Jonathan recognized the anointing on David's life. And instead of being like insecure and ridiculous about like yeah but my dad's the king and i should get to be the king like he like like recognized what was on david and Mm. like came alongside and served absolutely and so i love doing that i love recognizing what my strengths are and how i can serve like people who maybe have strengths that i don't have Mm. um so i guess songwriting came first and, and i love how god will take something take your weakness and make it strength and take the good and make it amazing i mean take the bad and make it amazing um because to be honest i think i always had a passion for writing but i think so much of why i threw myself so heavily into writing was probably based in my insecurity about singing i felt like i couldn't do it and i felt like i wasn't good at it and so i thought well if i'm not good at it i'll just do what i am good at and so i threw myself into writing because i thought well that's still a, a way of like being involved in worship or being involved in like songs um and so, yeah, for the beginning part, it probably was be- like a bit because of insecurity, um, but also because I loved songs. Um, the singing part definitely came a lot later on when I, which is, it's funny, I probably always could have done it, but I just, I really just second guessed myself a lot. And I think that's like a, something that rips people off so much. You know, we, we will blame lack of opportunity or people not affirming us or, you know, someone not believing in us but at the end of the day like you either believe what God has said about you or you don't and I think for a long time I second guessed that and it's amazing when I started just stepping out in faith and like faith is just taking a risk and actually trying when it feels like it's a bit above your head and Mm. um, when I started stepping out and um, just doing it like more and more I got like stronger and stronger at it and so now I think you know I used to get in the studio and just freak out and now I get in the studio and it's like so easy and quick and so i think singing definitely came later but i'm i'm grateful for the journey yeah well from what i know of of mia's story because we've written a a lot of songs together i don't know how many songs we've written together i probably should have done my homework before today but could uh, you take a a a guess of how many i don't know five ten probably 20 25 wow maybe probably even more than that maybe more than that 
there's a lot that there's a bunch that haven't got cut. <laughs> yeah, and which we were just talking about the new Sia record. For those of you out here who don't know, Sia just released a, a record of all the songs that did not make other artists' records, and it was I think just kind of her way of saying, "Hey, these are great songs. I believe in these songs, even yeah. if Beyonce didn't, or if Rihanna didn't, or if." Uh, Adele, then there are even songs that she had written, like one of them she wrote with Adele, right, mm -hmm. for, for the Adele record. Yep. And um, from what I know about Mia from probably the four or five years I've I've known her is just tenacity and just getting up and doing it again and again and again. How many sessions do you do a week? Um, I, I mean, I used to do like – seven or eight sessions a week maybe sometimes 10 um wow so that's so that's two two a day two a day so like 10 to two two to six um i used to do that lot i i feel like i do less now but i'm i'm smarter about the way i go about it now um i kind of think of it like a muscle and i tell everybody it's a muscle and like whatever you put in you'll get out because i think so many people think you either have the gift or you don't have the gift and i'm like living proof that you can have one thing that doesn't look like much and if you like are a really good steward over it and you work it then you begin to strengthen other things and like pull other things in that you need you know like i always was like really good at lyric and that but that was about it you know i didn't have i didn't play an instrument that was even useful for songwriting i played the euphonium which that's pretty useful. I, I haven't seen her bring it to a session yet, but I'm waiting for that day. I mean, you should have brought it today. Guys, if we write for Veggie, if we write for Veggie Tales, I'll bring it because I it feel is. like that will be like <laughs> nailing it. <laughs> um, so I mean, I didn't even I played the euphonium, so I had to learn learn guitar and I had to like like learn rhyme, had to learn phrasing, had to learn all of it. Um, but it's amazing how like you know if you if you go to the gym twice a year and like do like go hard out you're not going to see the same results as if you just went for like 20 minutes or 25 minutes every day. You know, there's there's going to be a bigger benefit of doing less consistently than doing a lot in one moment, you know. And I think songwriting's the same. I don't think, I think anyone can learn to write a song. I think some people are naturally given to it, but I think anybody could learn. Sure, yeah. What What was the journey that led up to the point that you were able and asked to, to walk in and, and do 10 sessions a week? Um, I think everything, I mean, it's like everything. I was just saying like, you know, I say to people all the time actually, like you, you have to let like God open doors for you because mm. so often I think we want to take things into our own hands and make our own opportunity and then we get so annoyed like when, you know, we have a gift and maybe like the church doesn't recognize it or our leaders don't recognize it. And I just think I would so much rather have God recognize what's on my life and him be setting things up for me than me like forcing my way. Because at the end of the day, everything's about timing and there's so much that I'm doing now that I'm so grateful for, that I so grateful that I wasn't doing it like seven years ago because I think I would have burned a lot of bridges and I just wasn't ready. Sure. Um, so to be honest, like I'm... I kind of um, started writing songs when I was like 14 or 15, but I would like write letters to God every night and say like one day I'm going to write songs that go all around the world. And I didn't have the skill set, but I was like just believed in my heart that God was going to use me for something special. So I think if you rewind all the way back, like at the end of the day, you can't, you have to be convinced that God is for you and that he's, he's kind and he wants you to win more than you want to win, you mm. know? And um, so I kind of like, I, I had that in my heart. I started positioning myself in environments that like would pull that gifting out. So I went to Hillsong College when I was 17. Um, I didn't do the music course. I did the pastoral course, but I was around, you know, that environment. And it's amazing how being in around an environment um, where the bar is high, it makes you reach further. Sure. And um, I would love to say, you know, someone took me under their wing and was like, you're amazing. Let's like make you get good songs and like let's help you become everything you're called to be and I guess in a sense like the like the community did that but in a way that was like you know have you ever seen like a you know like when it, when a horse is born like the horse has to get up straight away or a giraffe is born 
they have to get up straight away and giraffes like kick their kids until the kid gets up like mm. when when they're born i don't know why i'm talking about giraffe births but anyway <laughs> um i'm gonna guys, google this yeah like do a little picture um like everybody like go to go 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 there in your mind with me um but yeah giraffes when they have a baby they like kick the, the they have the baby and they kick the baby until it gets up because they like they're wanting it to like win and wanting it to survive you know and and I think an environment like that is actually way healthier than an environment that like flatters you or like pampers you. So I actually am super grateful for being in a team where like mm. I would bring songs and they would say, you know, like it's great that you're writing, like, but this is not strong. You need to work on this, this and this, you wow. know? Yeah. So it, there was no like flattery and I'm super, super grateful for that. I'm super grateful that nobody ever did, you know, gave me a charity song on an album, you know, like, oh, well, Mia's tried really hard this week. Let's just like throw her a bone, you know, like... I think it's great that, you know, that didn't happen. And, and, and so my story wasn't one of like guessing and guessing and guessing and then finally like having a win. It was one of like consist like for the last 14 years, it's been one of consistently just plugging away and getting better and better and better at songs and like letting God set up all the other stuff. Wow. Yeah, that's pretty awesome. And, and at the time, that actually is a really good analogy because especially as a new songwriter, when you're throwing your ideas out there for the world to hear for even just a room of people to hear and they say okay this is not good enough yet it feels like getting kicked oh totally I think um you know it's hard because songwriting feels so personal and I always say like um you know if you pour your emotion into every area of life like honestly it makes things quite messy you know anyone who's ever had a conversation with someone um, when you're emotional, you often don't say what you mean and you walk away and you think, oh, once you've processed it, you're like, oh, that was a bit ugly. But as far as art goes, I think if you pour your emotion into your art, it makes everything better. But the hard thing is when you do that, it feels super personal. So how do you like take something like and, and be able to separate your, your personal feeling from actually just being able to look at the song as like a craft and going, how do I get better at this? Sure. And like, what can I work on? Especially in like, you know, if you're writing for like, you know church or like you know if you have like a spiritual kind of experience when you're writing the song it's hard to be like here oh well you need to change it like because you're like well no I got pins and needles when I wrote it so then obviously it's like anointed right but I you know I always tell people like I wouldn't put that much pressure on a song like the song's anointed but I think like I go I don't think that's how God works I think God anoints hearts which kind of frees you up and goes I'm anointed and so like what I bring I can like change it or I can you know be flexible with it and make it better and actually like listen to what people have to say and understand that like they're trying to set me up to win mm. uh, and I think that's something we've talked about on the show before the importance of learning to be a collaborator as much as it is being a great songwriter and, and that's something that I think I've definitely learned since moving to Nashville and I'm, I'm sure you would say the same oh, totally. thing I mean a lot of the time it's what you bring in at the beginning might just be the the spark that starts something completely different or whatever. Totally. So, Mia always has, I mean, she's so prolific. She has, okay, here's my titles today. She comes in with her, her books of titles, five titles or whatever. I got this song. I'm going to write this song. This song. And it's, it's amazing how fast and how creative and how prolific her brain works. But even more amazing is learning to be able to collaborate and throw those ideas out and just let them kind of become what, God wants them to be or whatever the artist wants them to be totally. at the moment, you know, so. Totally. Uh, honestly, I think um, the healthiest thing that a writer can do is, like, be in a community and, like, be listening and, like, be, like, contributing. Um, I think an unhealthy environment for a writer is, like, being so insular about your gift and then only, like, you know, I have so many people say, like, oh, you know, I'll have, like, honestly, like, three or four people email me a week or talk to me at conferences about, like, oh, can we write a song? And I'll think like, yeah, but you've just been writing for like two weeks. Like you just picked up a pen two weeks ago. Like, and I, and I just think like that's not healthy. And I'll say to them, you know, the healthiest thing for you to do, or even I'll say, can I show you a song? And I'll think, yeah, but what do you want me to do about it? Because at the end of the day, like I can critique it, but then what are you going to do about your next song? Like it's not helpful to you. The most helpful thing you can do is develop your instincts. And the way you do that is by like, being in community and, and listening to what people are saying and learning to like gauge what's worth digging your heels in about and what's not, you know? And I'll say to people like, oh, you should like, you know, you should show some of your songs to some, some, some of your friends like that, you know, are doing music and they were like, well, no one's, no one's a songwriter around me. And I think, well, people don't have to be songwriters, you know, show a musician who's better than you, show a singer who's like better than you. 
show someone who's like a really great communicator at the lyric and see what they think you know there's always something and it's amazing how like we so many people want um so many people want community and want it to look a certain way when i think usually the people that you need to write in front of you you know, it's it's interesting. I was listening to another podcast uh, last night, um, WTF with Mark Maron, if, uh, and he was interviewing a like the father of the modern one man show, something like that. And uh, this guy was getting into uh, directing or writing for screen and stuff like mm-hmm. that. And so he sat down with Oliver Stone, uh, another famous director, and was like, "What what should I do to you know to create my cra- craft to become better? What, you know, give me some tips." And he's like, "Just keep doing it. You got to." keep doing it totally it's like there's no real magic <clears throat> wand that i can give you to anoint you into becoming the next great thing in hollywood it's just keep going you'll find your voice and then you'll find that community that resonates with it and that it'll totally. become what it is honestly i think like the the number one thing you know with songwriting is that it is hard because you put something forward that feels very personal and it can feel like a lot of rejection, especially when like you put something out and there's so much hope in it. You know, I don't, I mean, Seth, you could speak into this as well. Like there's so many times where someone will say, this is amazing. This is going to be the single. This is fantastic. Or this is getting cut on this record. And then, you know, the record rolls around and then the last minute it will get taken off. Mm. And I just have learned like to not hold my breath about things and put my expectation, not in like outcomes, but in like yeah. knowing that I'm like working hard and I'm getting better at what I do. Um, and, and just understanding that it's not rejection and that perseverance usually like the people that have persevered are the ones who are still around you know all the writers that we write with in town the people that just kept at it and kept going um not necessarily the most talented even though seth mosley's like like <laughs> stupidly talented no, agreed. Agreed. i am i am way <coughs> underqualified for for anything that i've ever been involved in so that is not true at all i think that's how we all feel well that's why we all need each other like that's you know and that's why co-writing is beautiful because i think you know the things i'm i'm really not good at um like if you guys saw me play the guitar you would laugh your head off because it's i'm terrible i only know two rhythms and they're both bad um prove it (laughs) 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 i mean i don't want anyone to turn the podcast off so (laughs) um but you know like the things i'm not good at like i always get partnered with people that like are so much better than me and so, like in, in makeup for like the areas that I'm weak in. And I think, well, that's the beautiful part. The things we feel unqualified for, underqualified for, you end up partnering with people who are overqualified for it. And then like everything ends up way stronger. Mm. You know, I always, I always say like for any writers, like get into co-writing because like how fantastic to understand, let's like start to learn that, that like the community, it takes a village. It always takes a village. Um, and the community is so good for you, letting people speak into it. So you don't become overly precious about your art is really important. Um, I don't when know if people out there realize how many writers there are on some mega pop hits. I was just looking at a Billboard article the other day, and I think it was Uptown Funk, which was one of the biggest songs of the last, I don't know, five years. It has I, I think it's 12 writers on it. Good Which grief. is craziness, <laughs> like yeah, and and then there was another one that was a big pit bull hit called Timber with Kesha on it, and that mm-hmm. one had fourteen writers on it. Wow, and and that's not unusual. Mm-hmm. So it's I think people would be surprised if they saw how much, uh, if I, they'd be shocked if they if they saw on the charts and they saw how many of those that were written by one writer. It's, I don't I don't know any. So, it's super rare, like that. There's one writer on a song. Um, why do you think that is? Because I think we're, we're better together. And I think <laughs> no matter how talented you are, I mean, I, I think even like, I think about even someone like Ed Sheeran, like he's probably one person that I know that I can think of that would be like perhaps a solo writer on a bunch of his stuff. Except that if you buy his album and you look at the credits, he's actually not a solo writer on a bunch of his stuff. Because even if you're super talented, honestly, like learning that like, others make you better is like such a great lesson um i think about someone like matt maher and like how super talented that guy is like he honestly can do everything and he doesn't need anybody to finish his songs except that he's such a generous writer and such a generous artist and he will pull people in because he wants wants the contribution and i think like it just that comes down to like to be honest if you won't co-write i i often don't think it's 
it's like a an issue of oh like I'm like particular about this song I think most of the time to be honest it's pride and it's like oh I don't want anybody to mess with my like my stuff or and or I don't want anyone to speak into it and I'm not like mm. willing to let people speak into it which I think that will keep your I think that will keep your writing world very small yeah no absolutely what advice would you give to someone who's listening right now and thinks yeah yeah, yeah I get it but you you've had all that experience I'm looking at a notebook full of songs and they are so personal and they're each my baby and I don't want to hand them to someone else because they could they could take it apart and say that it's not good what would you give to advice to someone who was like you at one point that had to eventually hand over a song for a critique totally. or for the possibility of them saying, I, I appreciate what you're putting out there. It's just not there yet. Yeah. Well, I think the the biggest thing is like being being willing to to let someone. Um, it's, it's easy to want to disagree because you love it so much. And when you've lived with something for so long, it's easy to be like, no, you can't change it. But like, you have to understand, like, you know, I said before, what's worth digging your heels in about and what's not. And, and honestly, it's just, it's just not worth it to like dig your heels in about one song. You know, you call them like babies and like often people will say like, yeah, it's my baby. And I think you need to become a rabbit and like, just like have a million babies. Like, <laughs> be, oh, that's the quote of the night. Right. right there, yeah. Be a rabbit. Like, um, because honestly, like you don't want to be the person that like is just wrote one song or two songs and then like literally protected those songs for your whole life mm. like i i love that like there's songs that i've i've written um and brought to people and people have said that's great we need to change this and i've said okay like there's very few songs where i've been like you know seth will tell you like there's very few songs where i've dug my heels in about like i think over the time like what that we've written like if seth's rung and said like um, hey, the label want to change this or an artist wants to change this or like, hey, we've been thinking about the song and like this needs to change. Like I've been like, yeah, cool. Like do whatever you want to do. Like sure. um, I can think of one song where I was like, I dug my heels in about it. And honestly, like in hindsight, I think it just wasn't worth it. It's just a song. Like who cares? Like it's good to like have integrity and to know when something is like something special and you should hold on. But for the most part, I just think keep moving forward like be committed to moving forward not like camping out and like building your <laughs> building your tent on one song who cares it's just a song write a better song you know what's amazing i i just listened to a uh, seth godin talk last night about really what it takes to be a successful person and he talked about the big marshmallow study that they did with scientists or the scientists did with little three-year-olds and they put them in a room and they said here's a marshmallow you can either eat it or at the end of 15 minutes, if you haven't touched it, you get two marshmallows. So what they, and, and it's kind of a sadistic study because they, they looked. <laughs> I would have eaten it in the first 10 seconds. Uh. Well, me too. But they, they, they fast forwarded to the same people that they did this study with 15 years later or 20 years later in their life and, and asked questions like, what's your you know happiness level, success, uh, college education, whatever, just kind of where they're at in life. And all the all the kids who did not eat the marshmallow were generally reporting higher happiness, wow. higher success. They had higher paid salaries. They were in higher level jobs. And what Seth Godin said about that was, it wasn't that they just had, it wasn't that the test, you know, changed their life forever and they decided that they were gonna have self control and blah blah blah. It was the fact that people can hold two separate opposing ideas in their brain at the same time. Wow. And what I heard from you just saying that is it's just a song, but then the other part is it's a song. Yeah. How important is a song and how many songs went straight to your heart when you were a kid and growing up and mm. still totally. do that every day. Totally. I always think, you know, it's funny, like my story of even like, you know, getting involved in church i did not i didn't grow up in church you know i grew up like in the complete opposite environment of that and honestly our family was getting food parcels from the salvation army so when i was a kid you know my mom didn't know god and um and it's funny how i this we we're getting these food parcels from the salvation army and then he like they would they would pick us up for sunday school so at five years old 
I started going to like this Sunday school and they started singing these songs about God and no one was teaching me about God and no one was teaching me about, you know, theology or anything like that. Songs became my theology and songs became the thing that led me to Jesus, you know? Wow. And I, I look, I look back then and I think, man, songs was the way that like I came to know him, like for myself, not just as like a theoretical idea or as like a, you know, a the- theological like obligation or anything like that, but like really know Jesus and, And I think about that and I think, well, what a privilege that like I get to like write songs today that lead people to Jesus and help them to know him, not just in a theoretical way or as a theological idea, but really know him. And I thought, isn't that like the poetry of God, you know, like the story that he's writing, that he would be like, I'm going to lead you to me through songs and then I'm going to get you to lead others to me through songs. Like, That's good. (laughs) That's it. Yeah. Again, like what you're saying that a song uh, I mean, you could write three in a day or, uh, you know, and so some of them could be tossed away, but there's that one that doesn't just speak to you. Uh, but someone 20 years from now is going to think back on that song. Like, Oh, that's the thing. That's, I remember the exact moment that I first heard that song and it still speaks to me in that same way. Totally. Well, that's the thing that makes it worth it, huh? mm. You know, like I, it is that, that, that thing of two ideas of being like, well, I don't want to be like overly precious and like, like dramatic about one song and like, because to be honest, like I think as a younger writer, I was, I was fairly reactive and fairly dramatic about like songs. But I think as well, it's because it, so much of it, I felt like I was guessing and I really didn't know what I was doing. And so it took so much more effort because I hadn't worked on the craft and I hadn't had some years with just getting familiar with like you know, just the different like fundamentals of songwriting. So everything felt like it was so much, it was such hard work. And so I would be so reactive every time um, I would like hand in a song or, you know, and, and to be honest, like people just don't want to deal with that kind of drama because at the end of the day, I want to, like I want to, and everybody wants to work with the guy that's easy to work with and they'll pick that guy over the talented guy every time, mm. you know, so learning how to, how to not like, even if it took a lot of effort and even if there was a lot of heart in it, learning how to go, you know, well, this is like, if this works, it works. And if it doesn't, well then like, I'll just write a better song it is like such a good lesson for people. And and like learning how to be able to take something back and say, okay, it's not good. Like, let me edit it and let me make it better. And being committed to like, being committed to becoming a great writer and not just writing a great song. Um, for me, that's been like a, a thing in the back of my head. I would, I would hate to have the journey where I, my first song is a massive song. And then for the rest of my life, I'm trying to like top that, Sure. Yeah. you know? And yes, there's like moments like where, I, you know, you've had like a big song or a big moment. But I just don't camp there. I I just go back to again. Just keep moving forward. Keep moving forward. Keep moving forward. And don't get, don't camp out at like a disappointment or don't camp out at like a success. Even you know, just keep moving forward. I think that's great advice because I mean, <coughs> this is coming from somebody who's had, and you you I, you may have even more than that. But just ones that I know of, you've had a, two giant number ones on on the radio charts this year with He Knows My Name and with the song called First. Mm-hmm. And for her to say, hey, don't camp out there. Don't just stop there. It's like, what's the next thing? Yeah. Well, I think even like don't become wrapped up in in that as success. Because for me, success is that, um, well, you know, like John Maxwell has that, that quote, like everything rises and falls on leadership. And I think so true. Um, but everything starts and ends with relationship. And like for me, success is that I have relationship with these people and these artists and these writers and producers that um, transcends one song. You know, it's like it goes so far beyond. You know, I love that even I'll write with Seth, but like, but secretly I'm like, you know, hanging out here to be like, I hope his wife Celie brings their little girl up because I want to hang out and like see their little girl. You know, and I think if you make people the prize and make relationship the highest thing and the king of the room, um, then like songs will do what they're meant to do. Sure. Um, I, yeah, I mean like, I think it's great that those songs have done well and that makes me excited but for the the artist but to be honest i wouldn't have known where those songs were even sitting on the radio unless someone texts me or like emails me and says hey ps your song's number one and even then i'm like that's fantastic okay i've got to go i've got to go to another session now but i just i don't get wrapped up in like the the business of it because i think once you start like you know so many people say oh you know well email ask me about like publishing advice and copyright advice and And I just think like, don't put the horse before the cart, you know, and don't get wrapped up in like that side of things too quickly because you'll start to stress yourself out. So to be honest, for me, I don't look at 
CCLR charts. I don't look at radio charts. I don't even really look at royalty statements. I don't do any of that just because I think I don't want that to be my motivation and I don't want want to always be thinking from that point of view. Sure. For, it sounds like you have a very – a good head on your shoulders, as well as you, you've become calm about the industry. And you, you don't have to let everything hit you like a ton of bricks because you've been there before, you'll be there again. Like you said, you've got to wake up and write another song, even if you've got a number one on the on the radio right now. Speaking to someone that was you at 13 or 14, or even yeah. when you started handing your songs uh, to other people for, uh, for critique, think of a person that maybe is in the middle of nowhere and they're thinking, well, like sure. Like the middle sure. of nowhere, like Australia? Uh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I mean, I, 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 my, my, what I understood was that you were in a community of artists at Hillsong. I was, but, you know, it, it was it was a, you know, a community that already has like a fairly massive platform. So it's mm. coming in as a 17-year-old who hasn't grown up in that church and who doesn't have like some of the, um, you know, the relationships like that these people have built, like, you know, going through through high school you know a bunch of these these people have gone through high school together and you know and we were all in college together like I fortunately was in college with a bunch of like the United team and that's how I kind of got involved and started writing but I was writing before that anyway you know it's just that yeah I I'm I'm a big believer of to be honest I think everybody wants somebody to tell them their song's good and and so I think to be honest that's where critiquing comes from and like I don't actually know that that's the best way to get better at songs. I think it, it's kind of like asking to be babysat all the time. And I can even see in hindsight for me that like handing in every song for a critique is actually exhausting to somebody else. And especially if that person is a writer and they're trying to write songs as well, you know, to, to have to like take on somebody else's um, gifting and some and be responsible for somebody else's like um, growth is actually exhausting. Sure. Um, so I, I think, you know, everyone wants a mentor, everyone wants to be told they're good, but I think you can glean from everything. And I think songwriting is about developing your instincts. So for me, I, when I wanted to get good at lyric, I would buy CDs that had amazing lyric on there and I would open up the covers and I would read through the lyric and I would start to look and identify things that like were patterns in like the lyric writing or, pat. you know, I would listen to pop music and I would identify you know, like melodic things that worked and that like, oh, this is what makes like a melodic hook. I get it, you know? Sure. And so it's about like, at the end of the day, you are responsible for you and like nobody is ripping you off. And I think sometimes we, we want to blame other people. But at the end of the day, you have the same opportunity that that I have. You have the same opportunity that, that anyone that is winning has had. And like, you you just have to like learn to glean from things. You know, I would go online and I would like, I would Google stuff and like Google like well, how to write a good lyric or I would Google like books on songwriting. You can get as good as you want to get, you know. It's it's the same as anything. Um, and I'm just, you know, I did have a community, but like the amount of songs that I wrote like versus the amount that got critiqued, it was probably about 30 to 1. Wow. Mm. See, I think that's wow. huge to think about because I bet by the time that you were writing, um, like if someone out there has written 10 songs mm-hmm. and they all are – what I was saying earlier, that baby, um, that it, it's very important for those 10 songs because th- that's my entire artistic statement in, in those totally. few things. But if you if you continue and you get to 25 or 50 or 100 songs, you may look back at those 10 and go, whoa, I've grown so oh, much from here. 100%. And I didn't even have to hand it to somebody to feel crestfallen about those. I just keep going and keep totally. producing. And that's the thing is if you keep moving forward, you'll see your own growth and you'll see whether you are growing or not. Like I like listening to songs now and I will listen to songs now compared to like maybe some of my earlier songs. And I think, gosh, like it makes me look back and think there, I could have changed this, this and this about those songs that got recorded. And honestly, thank God that my first songs didn't get recorded because I would be like, it would literally be like a running joke on the internet. It would probably be trending on the internet of how bad it was. Like, you know, my first two songs were rap songs. Like the first one was like, oh my gosh, it was like on a Casio, one of those kids. I've heard, I've heard me a rap before oh and I can gosh. vouch Which for Which Australian it. rap is just terrible. Like, you know, you want it to sound like it's like cutting edge, but Australian rap makes it sound like it's like literally like, I don't know, like a dropped pie. It's just terrible. <laughs> <laughs> um, we'll have to find that for the show. Do you oh, have man. a recording of your rap song anywhere? I do not, anywhere? fortunately. But the worst thing is I can remember the whole thing. Like, one, Can you give us like 10 seconds Oh of yeah, it? totally. Um, like honestly, it was like a Casio, little Casio keyboard and I didn't know how to play the keyboard. So I just would like 
you know, do this like baseline on like, you know, with my left hand, like, and it was out of time. I'm so excited about this. It was like, it was like, dun, 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 dun. My first two songs, that was the baseline, like for both songs, no difference. That's a good baseline. I mean, like, yeah, I didn't always hit the right notes, but it was all good. Yeah, that's okay. But it was like, it was very ahead of its time. So there was like, you know, a singing bit the girls would do. And then like the girls would sing like, Jesus, Jesus. And then the boys over the top would say, dream a dream, a new regime, shine like a sun, rise like cream, hit the light beam. Yeah, we've got the solution. Check it out, one, two, praise revolution. It was just, it was just dreadful. Like it was like the worst song. Like the second song I wrote was a song called You Make Me High. And it did not occur to me that like it sounded like a drug reference. Like you make me high, I'm going to Jesus overload. Like that just sounds like drugs. I couldn't work out why my worship pastor didn't love it. Um, But in hindsight, I'm so grateful that those things have not been recorded. And I'm sure that I will regret in like, about five minutes that I've just here's said the, this here's online. The, here's the thing. We're going to take what she just did, <laughs> put it over top of a beat, and it's going to be on iTunes in five yeah, minutes. Yeah, it's going to be. Oh, it's and it's going to be a massive <laughs> That's hit. Right. I'm, I'm, like, I'm going to make my first million off like you make me high. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Why? Why is she assuming that Jesus is selling drugs? This is this is not <laughs> yeah. this is not good theology here. I don't know. Like you never know. Like the stoners of the world might be like, I came to Christ through that song. Like you make me high. <laughs> Finally, a Jesus so, I can get behind. Yeah, I realized like that Jesus is the natural high in life, not anything else. <laughs> it's organic. Yeah. Oh gosh, I could do this all day. Colo- they might like it in Colorado and California. <laughs> <laughs> that is very true. <laughs> Man, I. <sighs> Again, I feel like we could sit and talk all day, but I don't want to keep you because I'm sure you have to go write uh, three or four songs. Oh uh, yeah, as like you, I've got leave here. all the songs. <laughs> <laughs> but I, such good actionable advice, uh, especially for those that, uh, like I was years ago, uh, and sometimes I am when I'm all alone right now, and I write a song. It's like, ugh, this is too much a piece of me. Uh, but putting it out there, that's the, the vulnerability of that and the perseverance to just keep doing it. Keep doing it. Honestly, everyone I know that is successful at this has been in it a long time. Hmm. And they kept doing it and they, they kept listening because it's one thing to keep doing it um, and protecting your gift. But it's another thing to be generous. And I have found that the world of the generous always gets larger and larger and larger. So be generous with your gift. Gosh. Awesome. Well, thanks so much for being on the show with us today. Loved it. This is a lot of fun. So much fun. Maybe we'll have you back again, and it, there will be no questions. It'll, It'll just, just be you rapping. Just rapping, yeah. yeah. Oh, my yeah, gosh. Yeah. I would love that. I'm yeah. going to start preparing yeah. immediately. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mia. Thank you. Hey, we hope you've enjoyed this episode, and we'll join us again soon on the Full Circle Music Show, the why of the music bit. Check us out at fullcirclemusic.org slash podcast.